Russian writers were divided in the second half of the 19th century about how to understand Napoleon Bonaparte. On the one hand, Leo Tolstoy, in his magnum opus, War and Peace, widely considered one of the greatest books ever written and a sprawling account of the Russian aristocracy and society during the Napoleonic Wars, was of the view that Bonaparte was a murderous brigand, a warlord bent on his own self-aggrandizement. He was scornful of the idea held by many in his own day that Napoleon was a great man, a figure who molded the history of his own times. Yet, the direct opposite view was presented in Fyodor Dostoevsky's equally revered work, Crime and Punishment. Here, the protagonist, Roskolnikov, justified his own crimes as being necessary to achieve something greater in his life, to rise to the position of an individual such as Napoleon, one who changes the world, even if his methods are destructive. It's a curious contrast in depictions. Perhaps both of them captured something about Bonaparte, but that they could have such different views was perhaps because the destructive impact of Napoleon on Russia was still in living memory when the two men were writing in the 1860s. Just half a century earlier, Napoleon had launched an unprecedented invasion of the Russian Empire by a European power, one which led to the virtual destruction of the city of Moscow. It would be the defining campaign of Napoleon's long career of over two decades. Napoleon's forces had crossed the border into the Russian Empire on the 24th of June, 1812. 129 years later, Nazi Germany would commence Operation Barbarossa two days earlier on the 22nd of June, 1941. In both cases, this was a potentially fatal strategic error as any invasion of Russia should have been commenced much earlier, preferably in the spring, to capitalize on the warmer weather before having to confront the Russian winter. But Napoleon had hubris on his side and a vast army. The first wave of the French invasion involved 450,000 troops, commanded not just by Napoleon, but some of the other greatest generals of the day in Europe such as Marshal Davout, Marshal Junot, and Napoleon's firm friend and ally since the 1790s, Joachim Murat, who by the time of the Russian invasion was the king of Naples. A division of Napoleon's Austrian allies was commanded by Karl von Schwarzenberg, the foremost Austrian general of the Napoleonic Wars. A raid against these was a Russian army of approximately 200,000 men commanded by Barclay de Tolly and Pyotr Bagration, two formidable commanders in their own right, but leaders of an army which did not have the fighting and strategic capabilities of La Grande Armée, the French military force which had vanquished all adversaries across Europe for so many years. The plan for Napoleon was simple. Engage in a series of forced marches to proceed as speedily as possible to see St. Petersburg and Moscow. Moscow, above all, was the prize. This was a much more difficult task than it might first appear. In the early 19th century, armies moved slowly, pulling artillery and supply trains by horse and marching on their feet. The distance from the Neyman River, where they first crossed into Russia, to Moscow, was a thousand kilometers. Such an army could at a stretch cover 45 kilometers in a day. But this rate was not sustainable day after day and would be slowed further by being harried by enemy forces. As such, it was something of a minor miracle that Napoleon managed to have his forces cross the extent of Russia, which they did in the course of July and August 1812. Particularly so, given that diseases like typhus struck La Grande Armée within days of crossing into the Russian Empire. On the 8th of July, Marshal Davout occupied Minsk in Belarusia. On the 28th of July, Vitebsk fell to the French. Then, on the 16th of August, Napoleon engaged the Russians at the Battle of Smolensk, winning victory and seizing the town. After regrouping here, in a town less than 400 kilometers from Moscow, Napoleon pressed on from the 25th of August and by the 5th of September was at Borodino 
just 125 kilometers from Moscow. It was an impressive feat, which had covered most of the distance to the Russian city in just over two months, but it had been hard won. Over 100,000 men of La Grande Armée had been lost, either through desertion or disease. And in a worrying portent of what was to come, orders had already been sent back to France to call up the draft of soldiers for 1813 and begin preparing to send them to Russia. The most famous battle of the Russia campaign followed on the 7th of September, 1812. The Battle of Borodino was the final major clash between La Grande Armée and the Russian army before the French moved on to Moscow. The Russians were commanded during it by Prince Mikhail Kutuzov, whom Tsar Alexander had replaced Barclay de Tolly with by that time. The clash was the bloodiest single-day battle of the Napoleonic Wars. Napoleon led just over 100,000 men onto the field of battle against upwards of 150,000 Russians. In the ensuing engagement, fierce close clashes were fought between the flanks and the main divisions. For a time, a swift surprise attack by divisions of Russian Cossacks threatened the French baggage trains and even Napoleon's own command center. But these were eventually repelled and a final attack on the Russian redoubts won the day and Kutuzov's forces broke. It was at this juncture that Napoleon made one of his greatest strategic errors. He had lost somewhere around 30,000 men to some 50,000 on the Russian side, either killed, wounded or captured. Faced with such heavy losses, Napoleon did not commit his Imperial Guard, the elite of La Grande Armée, to following up against the fleeing Russians. Had he done so, he might have finished off the Russians and their ability to maintain a field army in the months ahead. But he didn't, and the Tsar would be able to fight on through the late autumn and early winter. With victory at Borodino, the road to Moscow was open before Napoleon. No doubt he felt victory in the Russia campaign was within his grasp. But now, Tsar Alexander and his government did something which Bonaparte did not expect. They began preparing to abandon Moscow entirely. The week that followed saw the French gradually advance into the suburbs of the city, with much of Napoleon's advance forces commanded by his brother-in-law, the King of Naples, Joachim Murat. Napoleon himself was ill in the aftermath of Borodino and briefly lost his voice. Murat was inclined to negotiate with emissaries from the Russians and sent word back to the emperor that terms for the surrender of Moscow might well be feasible. In this light, Napoleon headed for the city, but stopped at the city walls in expectation of a delegation from Tsar Alexander to discuss possible surrender terms. But after waiting at the Doriga Milovskaya gate, messengers arrived to inform him that central Moscow was deserted. Out of a population of over a quarter of a million people, only some 10,000 Muscovites and somewhere between 10,000 and 15,000 wounded and convalescing Russian troops who could not be moved were still in the city. Napoleon was deeply perturbed by the turn of events. His career had always rested on the ability to defeat his enemy in the field. His mood worsened in the hours that followed as reports arrived that the city had been stripped bare of supplies. La Grande Armée had generally moved through Russia on the pretext that it could be largely resupplied from the countryside around it, and in particular, from the towns and cities it captured. Here was a real problem, given the overstretched nature of the French supply lines. And then the fires started. Tsar Alexander and his government had not simply decided to abandon their capital and strip it of as many goods and supplies that the French could use as possible. They had also decided to torch their own ancient capital. Although whether the Tsar or Count Fyodor Rastapchin, the governor of Moscow, was responsible for this decision remains a subject of considerable debate. The fires spread over the next day or two, even as Napoleon moved into the Kremlin, mockingly proclaiming of its defenses, what a scary war. But ultimately, the joke was on Napoleon. After witnessing much of the city engulfed in flames on the 15th, and marveling from the Kremlin at the fact that the Russians 
had done this to their own city, Napoleon was forced to leave the Kremlin as the fire risked spreading there and instead established himself at the Petrov Palace outside the city and safe from the inferno raging within. It is difficult to judge Bonaparte's state of mind in the weeks that followed. He had seized the enemy's foremost city, although theoretically St. Petersburg was the country's capital. But where such an action ought to have resulted in victory or an effort by his adversary to retake the city, the Russians had simply vanished and left him with his spoils. Writing to his wife, Empress Marie Louise, just over a week after taking Moscow, he commented, in what must be seen as one of the greatest pieces of unintentional irony in military history, that the weather was, quote, beautiful. But the somber reality is that he did not know what to do. The fires had finally been put out on the 18th of September, but the smoke had been visible from 200 kilometers away and had destroyed most of the city. Around the time he penned his letter to Marie-Louise, he sent diplomats to engage with the Russians and make it clear to the Tsar that he wanted peace negotiations. Ominously, Alexander did not even respond to these overtures. Meanwhile, the soldiers of La Grande Armée looted the city and surrounding region, even as Napoleon toyed with ideas like the abolition of serfdom in the conquered parts of Russia in an effort to engender the support of the Russian people against their own ruling class, a strange mix of liberal governance and military chaos. As bad as the situation had been in September, in early October, things took a drastic turn. The available resources in Moscow and the Muscovy region were now desperately thin. Then, the beautiful weather which Napoleon had written to his wife about became decidedly ugly. The first of the winter snows fell on Moscow on the 13th of October, 1812. By then, the French had been fanning out into the countryside around the city for some time in an effort to acquire food and provisions. But there, they faced guerrilla warfare from peasants sabotaging their efforts and raids by bands of Cossacks engaging in hit-and-run attacks. With winter now upon the French, and Tsar Alexander refusing to even countenance peace negotiations, the possibility of marching on St. Petersburg to try to end the war by seizing the Russian capital was abandoned. It was in such dire circumstances that Napoleon gave the order for the French to begin preparing to retreat from Moscow. They began to leave the city on the 19th of October, 1812, but not before attempting to destroy what little remained of the city, notably lining much of the Kremlin with gunpowder, which was set alight as they pulled out, destroying several buildings, though leaving others largely unharmed. A week later, the Russians re-entered the city, which would take the better part of half a century to be rebuilt and returned to its pre-invasion population. Meanwhile, Napoleon and his armies were desperately heading westwards towards the sanctuary of the Duchy of Warsaw. Napoleon's state of mind in the winter of 1812, as the French retreated from Moscow, was not good. His orders to destroy the Kremlin and what remained of Moscow were strategically pointless and were nothing more than a petty act of revenge by a man who had built his career on strategically sound action. Then, in the weeks that followed, as the French slogged their way through the cold countryside, constantly harassed and attacked by Cossack raiders, he received word from Paris that General Claude Francois Mallet had attempted a coup d'etat during his absence. It had failed, and Mallet and his main accomplices were quickly executed. But the very fact that it had occurred would have done nothing to better Napoleon's mental state. It went from bad to worse. It was an unusually cold winter, with temperatures in parts of Eastern Europe regularly falling to minus 20 degrees Celsius. By mid-November, the Russian attacks on La Grande Armée, as it sought to snake westwards with inadequate winter clothing and little food, intensified. Aware that the baggage trains could barely be protected anymore, the emperor ordered the destruction of his personal papers on the 20th of November to prevent his correspondence falling into Russian hands. Worse still followed, 
as over 25,000 men were lost trying to cross the river Berezina, where the Russians made concerted efforts to delay their retreat. Paradoxically, many military historians consider Bonaparte's success in actually crossing the river as one of his great victories, as La Grande Armée might have been completely destroyed right there in Belarusia had he not overcome the massed 85,000 or so Russian troops in the region. Thus it was that the bedraggled remains of La Grande Armée made it to Lithuania in December 1812, after one of the most disastrous invasions in military history. Only about 100,000 men survived the engagement intact, out of over half a million who were engaged in it in one form or another. There is something of a myth concerning Napoleon and the invasion of Russia in 1812, which ought to be dispelled. This holds that in a foretaste of the doomed German invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941, Napoleon failed to make any preparations for the onset of the harsh Russian winter and the impact it would have on his armies. This is not wholly true. In advance of the invasion, Napoleon had shown considerable concern for the weather conditions which would be encountered and had drawn together a large dossier of calendars, weather charts and almanacs to educate himself and his marshals as much as possible about the inclement conditions he and his men would face when the Russian winter set in. From these, he had been informed that sub-zero temperatures would not typically be encountered until mid-November, and he heeded this knowledge. The decision to retreat to Poland and Lithuania was taken instead of trying to advance against St. Petersburg in the full awareness that the winter was coming, and the decision to abandon Moscow in mid-October was arrived at in order to ensure that the retreat was largely completed before the weather turned. What doomed La Grande Armée was not a lack of preparedness or ignorance, but rather a combination of factors which included the lack of food and provisions after Moscow was burned, and also the fact that the winter of 1812 came early and was particularly harsh. For instance, on the night of the 12th of November, temperatures dropped in Belarusia to minus 24 degrees Celsius, cold enough to smother campfires and cause horses to slip and break their legs. Newspapers as far afield as the Times in London reported on particularly inclement weather that November. And so, unlike the Germans in 1941, Napoleon was not ill-prepared for the Russian winter, but was unlucky to a certain extent. Admittedly, though, he should have made the decision to abandon Moscow two weeks earlier than he did. With the arrival to Vilna, now Vilnius, Napoleon engaged in what must have been one of the fastest treks across Europe in the pre-railway and pre-train age. He left Vilna on the 6th of December, crossing the river Neumann the following day back into the Napoleonic Empire, the temperatures having briefly fallen to near minus 30 degrees Celsius at this point. Ahead of him, he sent the famous 29th Bulletin, in which he informed the French people of the disaster which had befallen La Grande Armée. By the 10th, he was on the road to Warsaw. The carriage moved almost endlessly, stopping only for coffee at a post house between 8 and 9 a.m. each morning and in the evenings to dine. Amusingly, Napoleon did not have enough money to pay for some of these stops and was not recognized, so that his traveling companion, Armand de Coulancourt, a close advisor of the emperor in the latter years of his reign, had to lend him some petty cash. Napoleon met with several ministers in Warsaw to give orders for the preparation of the defense of the region for the invasion by Russia, which would now follow. Then he was gone again on the morning of the 12th, stopping briefly at Poznan before going on to meet the King of Saxony to assess his loyalty, changed carriage at Erfurt, the axle of the previous one being broken, before making for Frankfurt. On the evening of the 16th, he crossed the River Rhine and from there stopped only briefly to have the wheels of the carriage greased and to eat. So it was that shortly after midnight of the 18th, 
Napoleon reached Paris to prepare for the inevitable invasion which would come from Russia and those who would seek to take advantage of his weakened position. Napoleon's retreat from Russia and the disastrous outcome of the invasion saw the formation of a new alliance against the French. Napoleon's enemies finally saw their chance to strike while the emperor was wounded. Britain had never made peace with France all through the struggles of the mid to late 1800s, and so it was simply a matter of the Russian and British governments re-coordinating their efforts. Sweden, with which Russia had recently been at war and which had lost Finland to its eastern neighbor, had already signed the secret treaty of St. Petersburg with the Russians in the spring of 1812 in response to the French occupation of Swedish Pomerania. Then, at the Convention of Tarogon on the 30th of December 1812, Prussia, after years of being crushed underfoot by the French, allied with Russia. Austria was more cautious. After losing four wars against the French since the 1790s, the government in Vienna was wary of Napoleon and conscious that the French Empress was a member of the Austrian Imperial House of Habsburg. But eventually, in August 1813, they would see that the tide had turned irrevocably and also joined the new coalition. In addition to the major powers of Russia, Britain, Prussia, Sweden and Austria, Portuguese and Spanish rebels and a number of smaller states in Germany and Italy joined the coalition, while eventually even former stalwart allies of Bonaparte's, such as Bavaria, joined the war of the Sixth Coalition against France. A slight difficulty for the Allies was the fact that war had broken out between Britain and the United States in the summer of 1812. The US was not theoretically allied with the French, but the War of 1812 was tangentially related to the European conflicts as Britain had been interfering with American shipping in the Atlantic in the context of the wider Napoleonic Wars. This would draw British resources away from Europe and in the War of the Sixth Coalition, which raged in 1813 and 1814, the great bulk of the fighting against the French was carried out by the Russians, Prussians and Austrians. The major front was effectively a movable feast which shifted from Russia westwards through Poland, Germany and then into France, though there were other fronts, not least in the Iberian Peninsula where the British and their Spanish and Portuguese allies won the Peninsula War and then began to advance into southern France in the autumn of 1813 following victory at the Battle of the Pyrenees. The months which followed Napoleon's return to Paris were oddly quiet, as all parties planned and prepared for full-scale war later in 1813. Bonaparte was concerned with conscripting hundreds of thousands of Frenchmen to create a new army, but these would be untrained, raw recruits, if they were even clothed and armed in time. His efforts were matched elsewhere as the King of Prussia called for a mobilization of every adult male of fighting age in his kingdom. Meanwhile, what remained of La Grande Armée in the east was brought back towards France even as the Russians advanced westwards behind them, taking Warsaw in mid-February and entering Berlin on the 4th of March. As news of these setbacks reached Bonaparte, he arranged for his wife and Jean-Jacques Regis de Cambesere, the second consul of France between 1799 and 1804, to form a regency government before setting off to take command of the army in Central Europe himself in mid-April, basing himself in Dresden by early May. He might have won a very significant victory over the Prussians and Russians at the Battle of Botzen in mid-May. But whereas the coalition forces were broken by Marshal Ney, a cavalry commander who was as prone to errors as he was success, he failed to block the retreat of the enemy and the major victory slipped through Bonaparte's fingers. Perhaps because they had nearly suffered a major defeat at Botzen, the coalition leaders realized that defeat of the French was not as assured as it seemed. Napoleon was down, but he was not out. And there remained the matter of Austria, which by the summer of 1813 had still not committed one way or the other in the war. 
Accordingly, on the 4th of June, Napoleon agreed to the truce of Pleswitz, a nine-week armistice between France and her few remaining allies with the coalition. During it, Napoleon mobilized the Army of Italy and ordered it to Laibach, the early 19th century name for the city of Ljubljana, with the intention of intimidating the Austrians into honoring their earlier alliance with France and committing to his cause against Russia, Prussia and Britain. It was a fruitless task, and already the Austrian chief minister, Clemens von Metternich, had signed an agreement in secret with Russia, whereby it would join the coalition once the armistice expired in August. On the 10th of August, Napoleon celebrated his birthday five days early in Dresden. It would be the last time he would mark the anniversary of his birth as Emperor of the French. The following day, the major powers denounced the truce of Pleswitz. Austria made known that it was siding with Russia, Prussia and Britain, and the War of the Sixth Coalition resumed. The climax of the War of the Sixth Coalition occurred in Germany in the middle of October 1813. The Battle of Leipzig, or as it is also known in the German tradition, the Battle of the Nations, was the largest battle ever fought in Europe when it was pitched between the 16th and 19th of October. The context was a considerable reinforcement of the French position, with troops from France and other parts of Western Europe, while the Truce of Pleswitz was in place during the summer of 1813. The Emperor then attempted to employ large contingents to take Berlin and knock Prussia out of the war, but this had failed. In the weeks that followed, the Russians, Austrians and Prussians began gathering their forces for a climatic battle with Napoleon. When they finally encountered each other near Leipzig on the 16th of October, the sides were not evenly matched. Napoleon had some 160,000 French troops under his control, with upwards of 50,000 Allied troops from Saxony, the Duchy of Warsaw and the Italian and Dutch vassal states. But the Russians, Austrians and Prussians, with some contingents of Swedes and German troops, brought over a quarter of a million men into the field at Leipzig, forces which swelled by nearly another 100,000 as the battle raged over the four days. The coalition troops also had twice as much field artillery as Bonaparte. Despite the numerical disadvantage he was at, Napoleon believed he could aggressively attack the coalition forces and take advantage of the fact that their lines were spread out over a large geographical space. But Emperor Alexander and the other coalition rulers and commands countered by allowing the commanders of individual contingents of troops considerable freedom of action, instead of trying to direct the actions of over a quarter of a million men centrally. This had been attempted at Austerlitz eight years earlier and had ended in disaster. But the broad plan was to encircle the inferior French forces around Leipzig. This soon proved broadly successful. Despite some initial tactical successes for Napoleon on the 16th, the next day saw limited clashes as the coalition forces moved to encircle the French. It was soon apparent that this would be successful and on the 18th, Napoleon requested an armistice. This was refused, and over the nine or ten hours that followed, there was fierce fighting as the Russians, Austrians and Prussians moved to complete the encirclement. By the end of the day, some of Bonaparte's German allies were switching sides to the coalition, and Napoleon began initiating measures to begin a fighting retreat westwards. The final day of the battle saw street-to-street -street fighting in the town of Leipzig as the French retreated. But Napoleon did manage to break out by the end of the afternoon with the remnants of La Grande Armée. By the time the fighting finished, both sides had suffered between 60,000 and 75,000 casualties in terms of wounded and dead. But given the numerical superiority of the coalition armies by the autumn of 1813, the loss of this many men was a disaster for Napoleon, which all but ensured his defeat in the War of the Sixth Coalition. In the aftermath of the Battle of Leipzig, peace talks were entered into between Napoleon and several of the coalition governments. In fact, tentative peace negotiations had already been engaged in between Bonaparte and Metternich 
during a meeting in the city of Dresden earlier that summer, at a time when Austria had not yet committed to the war and Vienna was hoping to act as a peace broker before the conflict expanded into Central Europe. These talks were now resumed in the immediate aftermath of Leipzig and resulted in what are known as the Frankfurt Proposals. Metternich was again central to these as the Austrians sought to preserve the position of the Habsburg princess, Mary Louise, Napoleon's wife, and the Empress of the French. Under the proposed terms, France would effectively surrender to the coalition, but Napoleon would be allowed to retain his throne. The terms were exceedingly generous, in that France would only be forced to return to the borders it had established around 1795. This ensured that the region around modern-day Belgium and all of Germany west of the River Rhine, as well as lands in the Savoy along the Franco-Italian border today, would remain part of France, despite having been conquered during the early stages of the French Revolutionary Wars. Incredibly, despite how precarious his circumstances were in the aftermath of Leipzig and the fact the British were utterly opposed to offering him such generous terms, Napoleon refused the Frankfurt proposals in November 1813. It was to be one of the greatest mistakes of his life. Having made his decision to continue fighting, Napoleon began withdrawing La Grande Armée, or at least what was left of it, back to France. By now, nearly all his remaining allies had melted away, with political leaders in even those parts of the empire, such as the Netherlands and Western Germany, who had been under French rule for the better part of 20 years, throwing in their lot with the coalition. By December 1813, the coalition forces had begun to cross the River Rhine, with the Austrians, Prussians and Russians bringing hundreds of thousands of men into eastern France early in 1814. Against them, Napoleon had less than 100,000 fully prepared men. With the coalition forces, in surely the greatest betrayal of Napoleon's life was Joachim Murat, Bonaparte's faithful ally since the events of 13 Vendemier back in 1795, his brother-in-law, brother-in-arms, and the man he had made king of Naples. Murat had agreed to an alliance with the Austrians in the hope of keeping his throne in southern Italy. On learning of this, Napoleon who must be said to have been a thinly veiled misogynist throughout his life, declared that his sister Caroline had made Joachim defect. It was she, not he, that had betrayed him, he reasoned. By now, he realized the full severity of the situation and was desperately trying to accept the terms he had been offered under the Frankfurt proposals. But with coalition troops flooding into France, the governments of Russia, Austria and Prussia now insisted that France would have to give up its territories in the Low Countries and Western Germany and return to its 1791 borders. This too was soon vetoed by the British, who were adamant that Napoleon could not remain as emperor. There was one final series of victories achieved by Bonaparte before he lost his throne for the first time. In January and early February 1814, much of the most significant fighting was occurring in northeastern France, a part of Europe which has seen more than its fair share of conflict over the centuries. The French were fighting a rear guard action here as they sought to delay the coalition forces' advance on Paris. It was in this context that Napoleon won a series of striking military victories reminiscent of his earlier days in mid-February. The Six Days Campaign, as it is known, saw Napoleon win four battles against the Prussian and Russian armies under the Prussian commander, Field Marshal Gerhard von Blücher. In these engagements, Bonaparte was considerably outnumbered, yet in each clash, he inflicted large casualties on the Prussians and Russians before redeploying for further strikes the following day. The culmination of this was the Battle of Vauchamp on the 14th of February, when Napoleon and Marshal Marmont led less than 12,000 men against Blücher's army of over 20,000. Here, Bonaparte did not even manage to outwit his adversary. Blücher simply realized that Napoleon was personally commanding the French forces arrayed against him, 
and attempted to withdraw from the field of battle. Such was the awe in which Napoleon's military capabilities were still held, even as his fortunes reached the low watermark. The retreat proved difficult to execute, and Napoleon sent Marmont in pursuit, resulting in a routing of the Prussians and Russians, which resulted in upwards of half their forces being killed, wounded or captured with minimal French casualties. The Six Days Campaign was something of an Indian summer militarily for Bonaparte. While it delayed the coalition advance into France and the capture of Paris by some weeks, it could not stop the inevitable. By late March, the armies of Prussia, Russia and Austria had advanced on the French capital and were nearing the suburbs. It fell to Joseph Bonaparte, Napoleon's older brother, who in recent years had become something of a drain on Napoleon, owing to his inability to control the Kingdom of Spain, to which he had been assigned back in 1808, to lead the last defence of the capital with some 30,000 men, who were scrabbled together out of various remaining detachments of La Grande Armée and raw conscripts. However, they faced advanced coalition forces numbering approximately 150,000 men, or five times their number, with tens of thousands more advancing towards Paris in their rear. Faced with such insurmountable odds, Joseph eventually retreated out of Paris, even as Napoleon was advancing into the suburbs with some reinforcements. It was there that he learned that the city had surrendered on the 31st of March. A day later, Tsar Alexander addressed the Senate in the French capital and convinced them to depose the Emperor of the French. Two days later, Napoleon was confronted by several of his most senior generals and marshals, men such as Michel Ney, whose rise to prominence in Europe had been largely under Napoleon's wing. The army, they informed him, would not fight any longer for him given the circumstances. It was then, and only then, that Napoleon finally seemed to accept the situation for what it was. Later that day, the 4th of April, 1814, he agreed to abdicate his throne once terms were agreed. At first, he attempted to do so in favor of his three-year-old son and namesake, but it soon became apparent that the coalition leaders were determined to crown Louis Stanislav Xavier, Count of Provence and brother of King Louis XVI, whom the French had launched the revolution against a quarter of a century earlier, as the new King Louis XVIII. The Bourbon monarchy was to be restored. On the 11th of April, 1814, Napoleon met with diplomats representing the governments of Russia, Austria and Prussia at Fontainebleau and formally abdicated. There they agreed the terms of the Treaty of Fontainebleau. Under the clauses involved in this, Napoleon confirmed his abdication and promised henceforth to renounce any future claims to France while the claims of any member of the Bonaparte family to rule France were also prohibited. He also had to surrender his personal estates in France. In return, Napoleon's first wife, Josephine, was to be allowed a certain allowance from the French state, while Bonaparte's second wife, Empress Marie-Louise, was to receive the principalities of Parma, Piacenza and Gustala in Italy, which would one day pass to Napoleon's legitimate son and heir, Napoleon Jr. But the most striking clause of the Treaty of Fontainebleau was that Napoleon was to become ruler of the small Italian island of Elba, off the coast of Tuscany in Italy, where the Bonaparte family had originally hailed from centuries earlier. This small principality was to become Napoleon's new dominion in compensation for the loss of his empire though he was to remain there henceforth and not to return to mainland Italy or any other part of Europe. Napoleon ratified the Treaty of Fontainebleau two days later, but the British, his most dogged enemy since the 1790s, refused to ratify the agreement, fearing that Bonaparte would soon return to France to seize power again under such an arrangement. But with the Russians, Prussians and Austrians occupying France, the decision was largely out of the hands of the government in London, led by the Earl of Liverpool as Prime Minister and Lord Castlereagh as the Foreign Secretary. Napoleon was to become 
Lord of Elba. Napoleon's ego had to be assuaged when he was exiled to Elba. Thus, when he arrived in the small Italian island at the port of Portoferraio on the 3rd of May, 1814, it was as the ruler of the island, not as a prisoner. He had the trappings of a ruler too. He would reside at the Villa San Martino, though he quickly established himself in a more central residence in Portoferraio for the most part, and would have command of a small army, despite the fact that it was completely unnecessary for the purposes he was being sent to Elba for. This was to consist of 870 men, 300 of them being a detachment of grenadiers and the rest a division of the elite imperial guard who had fought under the former emperor for many, many years. There was even an Elban fleet. Admittedly, it did only consist of one ship, the 18-gun brig the Inconstant, replete with a crew of 66 men, though two small sloops were also attendant on it. Hence, the small island of Elba suddenly found itself becoming a Mediterranean military power of a most peculiar kind. And it was not simply that Napoleon was allowed to play toy soldiers on Elba. As soon as he arrived, he threw himself into governing the island like a miniature France, focusing on developing the roads and reforming the tax system. He even formed a council of state in imitation of that which had been a component of the imperial government in Paris, as well as establishing a set of royal stables in Portoferraio. As he later claimed, it was his intention to create here a model polity which would be small but the envy of Europe. His subjects became less enthused very quickly with the high levels of taxation required to build this Napoleonic Mediterranean utopia. Beyond this, Napoleon had extensive company. Many of his most loyal followers joined him on Elba, and while his wife and son headed for the homeland in Vienna, Napoleon's long-standing mistress, the Countess Valeska of Poland, with whom he had sighed an illegitimate son some years earlier, did come to live with him on Elba. Shortly after his arrival on Elba, Napoleon received word of the death of his first wife and the woman with whom he was most closely associated throughout his life. Despite the multiple infidelities while married and his eventual divorcing of her in order to marry Mary Louise, Josephine had allegedly been engaged in a long walk with Tsar Alexander in the gardens of Malmaison in May 1814 in an effort to convince the Russian ruler that she should be allowed to join her former husband on Elba when she developed pneumonia. She died shortly afterwards on the 29th of May. News of her passing was not directly related to Napoleon on Elba. Instead, he learned of it from reading a French newspaper. On reading the sad news, the former emperor, normally a paragon of boundless energy and activity, retired to his room and was not seen for two days. It was a peculiar relationship, one which had been tempestuous for years but which had clearly been formed out of a genuine affection for one another despite the repeated betrayals of each other. Years later, when he died on St. Helena, Napoleon's last words were, France, the army, the head of the army, Josephine. News of other events across Europe was also gradually making its way to Bonaparte on Elba. On the same day he had arrived on the island, King Louis XVIII had entered Paris after years in exile in various parts of Europe, such as the Baltic States region of the Russian Empire and England. He made it known that he was an accommodating monarch and promised the legislators and Senate in Paris that he would respect many of the reforms and innovations in French society that had been implemented since 1789. He also quickly agreed the Treaty of Paris with Britain, Russia, Austria and Prussia. Through this, it was agreed that France would return to its borders as they had existed in 1792 on the eve of the outbreak of the French Revolutionary Wars. In return, France would not have to pay war indemnities to the nations which Bonaparte's armies had ravaged for years while the coalition powers also agreed to remove their armies from France speedily. The news that France was no longer occupied doubtlessly intrigued Napoleon on Elba. 
as did his growing awareness that the energies of Europe's statesmen had shifted to the capital of Austria. Beginning in November 1814, the Congress of Vienna met to redraw Europe's borders in the aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars, a diplomatic event which would not be superseded for a hundred years until the peace negotiations at Versailles in France after the First World War in terms of its diplomatic and political importance. Word may also have reached Napoleon in early 1815 that divisions were beginning to appear between the former allies in Vienna, with Britain and Austria growing increasingly wary of Prussia's ambitions in Germany and Russia's general emergence as the foremost power on the continent. Perhaps he could take advantage of these divisions, Napoleon mused, if only he could seize power beyond Elba once again. It is notable that when Napoleon was negotiating with the Russians, Prussians and Austrians at Fontainebleau in April 1814, he had been offered a choice of whether he wished to rule over the island of Elba or Corfu as his island kingdom. He turned down Corfu, a significantly larger and more historic island. His reasoning, one imagines, is that with its location off the coast of northwestern Greece, Corfu was simply too far away from France. Whether he intended from the very beginning to escape at some point is unclear, but his hand might have been slightly forced by the arrival of news that deliberations were underway at the Congress of Vienna to change the circumstances of his retirement. The British, in particular, were pushing for more stringent punishment of the former emperor, and all of the coalition powers were resisting calls for additional funding to be sent to him, which had been a stipulation of the terms agreed on at Fontainebleau in April 1814. These developments, combined with news of unrest in France against the restored Bourbon monarchy, convinced Napoleon that he should leave Elba and roll the dice one last time against his enemies. Having consulted his mother, who had joined him on Elba, he quickly put together a small fleet of ships, and on the 26th of February 1815, with a small army and court of just over a thousand followers, he set sail for the French Riviera with the goal of seizing power back in France and rebuilding his empire. Only someone with the towering ambition and energy of Napoleon Bonaparte could have deigned to think he could be successful in this endeavor. What was most remarkable is not that he would ultimately fail, but that he very nearly succeeded. The period following Napoleon's escape from Elba is generally known as the Hundred Days, though some term it the War of the Seventh Coalition. The phrase, the Hundred Days, is itself something of a misnomer, as it used to refer to the period of time between when Napoleon first arrived back in Paris from Elba on the 20th of March, 1815, down to the 8th of July, when King Louis XVIII once again resumed the French throne, a period of 110 days in all. After landing near Cannes and Antibes in southern France in early March, Bonaparte made his triumphant march from Paris and seized power there with earlier turncoats such as Marshal Ney once again joining his cause and King Louis fleeing the capital in the wake of Napoleon's arrival. In Vienna, the main coalition powers, Britain, Russia, Austria and Prussia, issued a public condemnation of the former emperor and each committed to bring 150,000 men into the field against Bonaparte. They were able to mobilize these troops very quickly, as hundreds of thousands of soldiers were still in arms across Europe. The result was the Waterloo campaign of mid-June in what is now Belgium and in which Napoleon was defeated, the invasion of France by the coalition and Napoleon's second abdication on the 22nd of June following which he attempted to simply retire from public life, but soon realized he would have to leave France entirely as the coalition forces entered Paris on the 7th of July and reinstalled King Louis XVIII as monarch the following day. When he returned to Paris from Elba, Napoleon's energy was as boundless as ever. During the Hundred Days, he dictated or wrote over 900 letters. Moreover, his ability to micromanage and his concern for the minutiae of government was steadfast. For instance, on the 24th of March, 
Four days after he returned to the capital, he was writing to officials about that year's budgets for the Parisian theatres. More pressing was his need to have his marshals, the leaders of La Grande Armée, who he raised to positions of immense authority back in the mid-1800s, declare in support of his cause. Some, such as Marshal Lefebvre and Marshal Davout, did so immediately. But of the approximately two dozen marshals, only half would eventually do so. This was a significant issue, for these men often had the loyalty of the divisions which they commanded. And so, in order to obtain the full support of the military, Napoleon needed their loyalty. Curiously, one of those who did declare for Napoleon was his brother-in-law, Joachim Mura, who had betrayed him back in early 1813 in order to preserve his position as King of Naples. He had done so successfully on that occasion, but his decision to now support Bonaparte again was suicidal and ultimately led to the loss of his throne and his life. Although the priority was clearly on preparing for the inevitable military clash, Napoleon also spent much of the Hundred Days in Paris dismantling the reforms which had been introduced by Louis XVIII during his brief period as king. To do so, he dissolved the legislature and other political bodies, which he viewed as having conspired to restore the Bourbon monarchy and called for the electoral colleges of the country to convene in Paris with a view to giving their assent to a new constitution which Napoleon was drawing up. It perhaps provides a window into his psychology here that he was taking such steps. His energies should have been fully committed to the military campaign, for all else was immaterial until he could defeat the coalition forces in the field and solidify his position as emperor once more. If he could not succeed in that, plans for new constitutions or theatre budgets were pointless. Furthermore, there were other problems elsewhere. A rebellion began in the Vendée almost immediately, the most conservative part of France and one which had fought bitterly in support of the monarchy in the 1790s. With such pressures building, on the 4th of April, Napoleon wrote to the leaders of Britain, Russia, Austria and Prussia that, quote, after presenting the spectacle of great campaigns to the world, from now on it will be more pleasant to know no other rivalry than that of the benefits of peace, of no other struggle than the holy conflict of the happiness of peoples. Peace, Bonaparte claimed, was what he wanted now. The coalition would have none of it. The battle which would bring about Napoleon's downfall for the second time took place at Waterloo in Belgium on the 18th of June, 1815. Bonaparte's plan for dealing with the armies of his enemies was to pick them off one by one early on, before they had a chance to coalesce and move in a concerted fashion towards Paris. To that end, he headed northeast from the French capital on the 12th of June, with the goal of striking at an army which Arthur Wellesley, the British hero of the Peninsular War, who had been ennobled as the Duke of Wellington the previous year, was building up with British troops and Dutch and German allies in the Low Countries. These men numbered in the region of 25,000 British soldiers and 40,000 German and Dutch allies, but coming to support them was a force of 50,000 Prussians under Blücher. Against them, Napoleon had around 70,000 men, though with a much superior artillery train, it was these armies which would clash at Waterloo on the 18th. Before that happened, on the 14th of June, Napoleon issued a last stirring proclamation to his troops. Soldiers, this day is the anniversary of Marengo and Friedland, which twice decided the destiny of Europe. Then, as after the battles of Austerlitz and Wagram, we were too generous. We believed in the protestations and oaths of princes to whom we left their thrones. Now, however, leagued together, they strike at the independence and sacred rights of France. They have committed unjust aggressions. Let us march forward and meet them. Are we not still the same men? To oppress and humble the people of France is out of their power. Once entering our territory, there they will find their doom. Soldiers, we have forced marches before us, battles to fight, 
and dangers to encounter, but firm in resolution, victory must be ours. The honor and happiness of our country are at stake, and in short, Frenchmen, the moment has arrived when we must conquer or die. The Battle of Waterloo was actually a series of small battles, which played out around Mont Saint-Jean, but it has become known as the Battle of Waterloo, as it was near the village of that name that Wellington decided to make his stand against the French on the 18th of June, after learning that Blücher's Prussian forces were near enough to join with his own combined British, Dutch and German armies, thus swinging the numerical advantage from the French to the coalition armies. Much of the fighting consequently centered on Napoleon's efforts to break through Wellington's position and scatter the British, Dutch and Germans before the Prussians arrived to reinforce them. But despite the sustained French assault, Wellington held out for long enough for the Prussians to begin arriving in the afternoon. As Blücher's men began attacking the French flank, Napoleon had to commit his men to one final last ditch assault on Waterloo. But this failed, and in the hour or so that followed, with more and more Prussian divisions arriving, the French were routed. By the time the battle ended, nearly half of Napoleon's forces had been killed, wounded or captured. Wellington's armies had suffered nearly 15,000 casualties, but the battle had been won, and with the Prussians now in place with the British, Dutch and Germans to begin to advance into northeastern France, the war was effectively over before it had begun. Had Napoleon been able to destroy Wellington's army before they were reinforced by the Prussians, he could well have then attacked the Prussians and knocked them out of the war. This would have bought him time to recruit new forces and prepare France for an attack by the Russians and Austrians. But with the defeat at Waterloo, a combined British, Dutch, German, Prussian, Russian and Austrian invasion now beckoned. It was over. Napoleon's brief effort to re-establish himself as Emperor of the French had ended in failure. In the aftermath of the Battle of Waterloo, Napoleon returned to Paris, arriving there on the 21st of June. In the retreat from Waterloo, over 10,000 of his men deserted, and it was clear he could not fight on. Despite this, he made some vague efforts at drumming up support in the capital for raising a new army. It met with complete disapproval. Instead, the Chamber of Deputies largely took power into its own hands and informed Napoleon that he would have to abdicate for the second time in a year. As in 1814, he attempted to abdicate in favor of his infant son, but the Chamber of Deputies yet again rejected this proposal, and it was clear early on that Louis XVIII would be asked to resume his position on the throne after Bonaparte's brief resumption of the imperial title. Fighting continued for the next week and a bit, with Marshal Davout loyal to Napoleon until the very end, fighting the last engagement of the Napoleonic Wars against the Prussians at Issy to the south of Paris on the 2nd and 3rd of July. By the time the Battle of Issy was being fought, Napoleon was making plans to escape from France before the coalition powers could capture him, as they had done the previous year. He seemed determined to escape to and settle in the United States something which his brother Joseph eventually managed to do. But in Napoleon's case, he was refused a passport to do so by the provisional French government. Consequently, after seeing his mother for one last time in northern France in late June 1815, the great enemy of Britain for the last 20 years found himself in the unusual position of surrendering to the Royal Navy in the English Channel. He was quickly taken to southern England where the man who was now referred to simply as General Bonaparte spent a few days on a ship in the harbor of the west country town of Torquay before being taken onwards to the port of Plymouth where he was again not allowed to leave the ship. There, he discovered the grim fate that awaited him. The government in London had determined that Napoleon was to be exiled to one of the most remote corners of Britain's ever-growing empire. His destination was the island of St. Helena in the middle of the South Atlantic Ocean, which is simultaneously 4,000 kilometers from Rio de Janeiro 
and 2,000 kilometers from Angola in southwestern Africa. The British were making sure that there would be no second escape from exile and no need for a second Waterloo. Napoleon was quickly dispatched to his desolate new home. On the 7th of August, 1815, eight days after arriving in Plymouth and without ever setting foot on English soil, he was transferred from the Bellerophon, the ship he had arrived on, to the Northumberland. Two days later, the vessel departed on the 7,500 kilometer journey. The voyage lasted over two months and they did not arrive at St. Helena until the 15th of October, 1815. There, Napoleon was greeted by William Bolcom, a former employee of the English East India Company, who had taken up a position on St. Helena, an island which was a stopping point for British ships heading to India in an age before the Suez Canal was built in Egypt. Bolcom offered Bonaparte the use of a house called the Briars, while more lasting accommodation was prepared for him, a house which, in an ironic twist, had briefly been the residence of the Duke of Wellington back in 1805 when he stopped for a time on St. Helena when returning from a tour of duty in India. It was from here that Napoleon would have first explored his new home, an island which had been formed from a volcanic eruption and which measured approximately 16 kilometers by eight. Bonaparte was soon relocated. His more permanent residence on St. Helena was Longwood House. This had also been owned by the English East India Company, but the British government took it over in 1815 in order to set it up as Napoleon's residence, not least because it was in a good position to keep the former emperor well guarded, although the specifics of his detention on the island were that he was effectively under a form of loose house arrest. The house was spacious, though it was known to have a vermin problem. Here, Napoleon had his own small library, a study, and a billiards or map room. His own room was spacious enough, though with a small bed and hardly similar to what he had enjoyed in his palaces in Paris, though Napoleon had never fully acclimatized to the trappings of power in that respect. There were other rooms for household staff and some of Napoleon's companions, though amongst them was space for an orderly officer, a British soldier, who was effectively on site to keep an eye on the prisoner and report back on his activities to Hudson Lowe, the governor of St. Helena, who arrived there shortly after Bonaparte and who was effectively the former emperor's jailer for the next six years. They had a precarious relationship and after a serious argument in August 1816, Lowe refused to ever converse directly with Napoleon ever again, instead using go-betweens for the next half a decade. While Napoleon was settling into his new surroundings on St. Helena, back in Europe, the continent was being reshaped after a quarter of a century of unrest, which Napoleon had been central to. Already after his first exile to Elba, Diplomats and ministers from Europe's states had begun congregating in the Austrian capital, Vienna, to redraw the borders of Europe. But these efforts had been interrupted by Napoleon's escape and attempt to re-establish himself. Now, in 1815, they reconvened. The Congress of Vienna was dominated by the Austrian chief minister, Metternich, who years earlier had been central to negotiating Austria's marriage alliance with Bonaparte while France's chief negotiator was Talleyrand, a close ally of Napoleon's for many years. Thus, the Congress was comprised of many survivors from the years of instability. But it was clear who the victors were and who were the losers long before any agreements were reached. France stood to lose much, as did nations like Bavaria, who had not so much been forced into becoming vassals of France but had been complicit in Napoleon's wars of aggression. Equally, the days of the Duchy of Warsaw and states like it, which Bonaparte had created as buffers against his enemies, were numbered. By way of comparison, Britain, Austria and Russia in particular had been stalwart enemies of the French for much of the period since the early 1790s and were the clear winners, while Prussia and several others would at least expect restitution of the lands they had lost in the 1790s and 1800s. The final agreements were wide-sweeping, 
France was largely restored to its borders in 1789 without loss of any pre-revolution lands, a coup achieved largely on account of Talleyrand's excellent diplomacy. The Duchy of Warsaw was dismembered, with Prussia, Russia and Austria reclaiming lands in Poland and the surrounding regions which they had lost during the war. Prussia also received lands from Saxony, a willing ally of Napoleon's for a time from the mid-1800s. Russia retained control of Finland, which it had seized from Sweden during the wars. In Germany, a new German confederation of 39 states was established under the presidency or leadership of the Austrian emperors, a coup for the Viennese government, which put it in prime position to dominate Germany going forward, though things would turn out very differently over the next century. The Low Countries were established into a united monarchy, though Belgium would agitate for and receive independence in 1830. Italy remained fragmented into over a dozen states. Finally, Britain, the most stalwart of all France's enemies since 1793, and the state which had bankrolled many of the wars against Napoleon and the French, was compensated by way of numerous significant overseas colonies. For instance, Britain retained control over the Dutch Cape Colony, and this formed the basis of British South Africa going forward, while it also received several important islands in the Caribbean and Ceylon, the name at the time for Sri Lanka. All of this was a boon to the growth of the British Empire, which entered into a period of seemingly endless expansion over the course of the 19th century. Thus were the borders of Europe and much of the world redrawn once Napoleon was removed from the concert of Europe. Word of all these developments would have arrived with Napoleon back on St. Helena in a rather belated and controlled fashion. His captors deliberately censored what information about European politics he was allowed to receive. In other ways, his life on the island was not all drab. He had not left France alone in the summer of 1815, and some of those who had travelled with him had been allowed to accompany him to St. Helena. They included Charles Tristan, Marquis de Montalon, who had aided Napoleon in the coup of 18 Brumaire that brought him to power in 1799, and had fought with him at Jena in 1806 and Aspern Essling in 1809. Similarly, Baron Gaspar Gorgo had been a close companion of Napoleon's during the Russia campaign, one charged with a senior role in the artillery. He too travelled into exile on Saint Helena. Others included the Grand Maréchal, Comte de Bertrand, and Comte de Las Casas. These generals brought their wives and families with them, so that in all there was a small community of about two dozen French people who lived in and around Longwood House on St. Helena during the late 1810s. Another significant companion of Bonaparte's during these years was Betsy Bolcom, the teenage daughter of William Bolcom, who had first settled Napoleon into the briars on his arrival. Betsy was one of the few people on the island who spoke French, and although she was just 13 years old when the party arrived on the island, she became an unofficial translator of sorts. Over time, she and Napoleon became friends to the extent that she called him Boney, though the acquaintance was cut short in the spring of 1818 when Governor Lowe, fearing that the Balkans were becoming too close to Napoleon, had the family sent back to England. For a man who had set a relentless pace of activity, conquering nations and governing them for the previous 20 years, life on St. Helena was extremely slow for him. Yet he found ways to remain active. He was by all accounts an avid card player, with patience games being his favourite, and numerous hands of patience became named in his honour afterwards in Europe. A similarly sedentary activity was his gardening. By 1819, Bonaparte had laid out a series of gardens around Longwood House. As the Comte de Montalon wrote later, Napoleon would be up at 5 a.m. most days, and often when they arrived at Longwood, they would be greeted by him with a spade in hand in the garden. In fact, Bonaparte seemed to attack his horticultural pastime 
with the same vigor of a general laying out a camp. Charts were drawn up, walls were built, and the actual gardens themselves were extensive. 24 large trees were added along with extensive rose bushes, and Napoleon even installed a watering system. In doing all of this, Napoleon drew on his small court in exile, and for much of the second half of the 1810s, the Napoleonic court on St. Helena became a small armed camp of gardeners. It was not much of an army, but it was the only one he had left. Other than this, Bonaparte resumed his writing which he had engaged in since his teenage years, but which had been broadly interrupted by his rise as emperor. His interests had not shifted. His heroes were still Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar, figures whose conquests Napoleon had a strong claim to having emulated, only to have his empire collapse as quickly as Alexander's had. The only difference was that the Macedonian monarch had died before his empire fragmented. Napoleon had lived to see his own collapse before him. On St. Helena, he determined to write a series of commentaries on the life and campaigns of Julius Caesar. He dictated this to the Comte de Marchand, a book which explores Caesar's wars in Gaul, the civil war with Pompeius Magnus, and the subsequent efforts by Caesar to pacify the Republic before his assassination. Napoleon also made strides towards learning to speak and read English during these years, with the specific goal of being able to read the English language newspapers which arrived in St. Helena with news of what was occurring back in Europe as the continent moved on from the Napoleonic Wars. Inevitably, conspiracies were hatched, either on St. Helena or back in civilization, to facilitate the escape of or to rescue Napoleon Bonaparte from the island and once again seize control of France. Much of this was idle talk, not least that entertained in the social circles which surrounded Joseph Bonaparte in the United States. However, one plan seems to have been relatively coordinated, though scholars disagree as to whether or not it was ever actually initiated. In prison during the 1820s, one Thomas Johnson, a notorious smuggler and sea captain, related to his cellmate how he had been contacted by some Bonapartists in France in the late 1810s and had become involved in a plot to rescue Napoleon from St. Helena. The scheme was designed around sailing to the isolated Atlantic island with a submarine on board a ship. Remarkably, the submarine would have been based on the design of Robert Fulton, who had petitioned Napoleon for funding for his research into submarines back in the early 1800s. The plan was to sail close to St. Helena and then use the submarine to rescue Napoleon from the island itself before being drawn to the ship and then sailing for Europe. The story is probably too good to be true, but there's little evidence one way or another. In any event, it would never be realized as Napoleon died before the scheme ever came to fruition, according to Johnson. By the late 1810s, Napoleon's health was deteriorating considerably and somewhat prematurely. Although it is easy to forget, given the remarkable events of his life up to that point, when he arrived on St. Helena in the late autumn of 1815, Bonaparte was still only 46 years of age. The causes of his ill health have been widely debated over the last two centuries. Napoleon's own physicians, and there were several, had varying ideas. His Irish doctor, Barry O'Mara, complained to the government that the main issue was the circumstances in which Napoleon was forced to live. By the late 1810s, Longwood House was in a poor state, with mold and damp pervading the house, and this was compounding Napoleon's underlying health problems, which were exacerbated by his hefty weight. Admittedly, the government did take heed of these assertions, and plans were underway to build Bonaparte a new residence, which would be more suitable for his health problems. However, he would never move from Longwood House, as his health deteriorated drastically around the time the new residence was being completed. With a noted deterioration in his health in the spring of 1821, Napoleon decided to draw up his last will and testament. He did so with the Marquis de Montalon in attendance 
who appears to have drafted the original, but which Napoleon then copied out in his own handwriting, so that there could be no doubt of the fact that these did indeed represent his last wishes. The document ran to five large pages. Peculiarly, despite his pronounced atheism, or at least agnosticism, throughout his adult life, the document began with Napoleon claiming that he would, quote, die in the apostolical Roman religion, in the bosom of which I was born more than 50 years since. The emperor of the French was not quite a deathbed convert. He had gradually shown a revived interest in Catholicism during his last year or two. Much of the document concerned his second wife and his legitimate son, with Napoleon bequeathing what few possessions he had with him on St. Helena and back in France to Napoleon Jr. He then launched a series of attacks on those who had betrayed him over the years, men such as Talleyrand and even his own brother Louis for publishing a libel against him in 1820, which he deemed to be full of falsehoods. He then pardoned these individuals for their transgressions, but one gets the sense this act of magnanimity was designed more as a way of mentioning their alleged treasons than anything else. Yet Napoleon was also aware of his own failings, though he never admitted it. A major aspect of the will was his statement that his murder of the Duc d'Anguillon in 1804, an event which had turned opinions against him in many circles within Paris's politics, had been justifiable on the basis that d'Anguillon had been conspiring against him. Almost nobody believed this by 1821, but Napoleon was steadfast in claiming he would act the same way again if presented with the same scenario. Napoleon's final illness struck in early May 1821. By the afternoon of the 5th of May, it was clear that the end was nigh. He would pass away at 5.29 p.m. that evening. There were about 20 people present when he died. These included several medical practitioners who were attending Bonaparte in his last illness, but also the members of his miniature court in exile, such as the Comte de Montalon and the Countess Bertrand and her children. Napoleon was also attended by a chaplain, Angelo Paolo Vignali, who had arrived on St. Helena from Napoleon's native Corsica back in 1819, as the former emperor reacquired his Roman Catholicism in his last years. The cause of his death seems relatively clear. It was owing to a severe gastric illness, which doctors had conjectured in his final years, but which was most likely stomach cancer, given Napoleon's father had died from the same illness before his 40th year. News of his death would not reach Europe for over a month, but when it was declared through the London and Parisian papers on the 4th of July, the words used might well have mirrored his own. About a week before he died on St. Helena, Bonaparte, ever the micromanager, had dictated the news announcement of his own death. Ever since he died, suspicions have abounded that the former emperor was in fact poisoned. There are some considerable reasons for this. He was, at 51, after all, still a relatively young man, even by the standards of the time. Bonaparte himself fed such suspicions with the statement in his last will a few weeks before his death that he would, quote, die before my time, murdered by the English oligarchy and its assassins. Yet no evidence has ever been produced to indicate that the British government decided to kill Napoleon after over half a decade in exile on St. Helena, and this statement was more a reflection on his having been banished to the Atlantic island than anything else. After all, why would the British government have killed him when his detention there had been broadly successful? Moreover, the most common theory concerning his poisoning does not stand up to scrutiny. This holds that Napoleon was slowly poisoned through the use of arsenic in the wallpaper of Longwood House, which he subsequently breathed in and died from slowly. There is a kernel of truth to this theory, but only insofar as arsenic was used widely in the 19th century to create green wallpaper. In fact, while it may seem peculiar to modern minds, arsenic was used for all manner of things in early modern times, including as a popular additive in makeup. As such, 
While Napoleon's health doubtlessly suffered from the arsenic wallpaper at Longwood, there was no intention to kill him by hanging it on the walls. Rather, Napoleon's death was in line with his genetics and his father had died back in 1785 at a similarly young age from a similar gastric ailment. By the time Napoleon died in 1821, it had become customary to cast death masks of prominent and famous individuals. This was an age before cameras, although the first daguerreotype cameras would appear in 1839, and so the creation of a death mask was a method of memorializing the features of an individual at their time of death. To create this, a mixture of plaster and wax was placed over Bonaparte's face where he lay dead in Longwood House. This was then left to harden before being removed, offering an imprint of his face. In the days that followed, several copies of the mold were cast from the original, and these soon made their way to both Europe and the United States, where they had colorful subsequent histories. One ended up in Italy, where it had been sent for the sculptor Antonio Canova to produce a more artistic sculpture, but he died before he could do so, and this version is subsequently understood to have been sent to England and now sits in the British Museum. Another copy is believed to be in Cuba, while a third is understood to have been sent to New Orleans, where it briefly ended up on the equivalent of a 19th century skip during the tumult of the American Civil War, before being rescued. And today, other copies are to be found in museums in places as diverse as Auckland in New Zealand and Boston, Massachusetts. An autopsy was carried out on Napoleon's body on St. Helena by his physician Francois Carlo Antomachi. Antomachi was one of the individuals who ended up with a copy of Napoleon's death mask, most likely that which ended up in Cuba. More bizarrely, he cut off Napoleon's penis and had it preserved. The member subsequently ended up back in Corsica. Today, it is in the possession of the Latimer family and rarely shown to the public. The rest of Napoleon's remains were afforded a bit more dignity. He was buried in the Valley of the Willows on St. Helena, despite his request in his last will that, quote, my ashes may repose on the banks of the Seine in the midst of the French people whom I have loved so well. As neither the British nor indeed the French governments wished to make a public event of his possible burial in France in the early 1820s. Nevertheless, with changing politics back home, the French government did desire a public funeral by 1840. His remains were consequently exhumed on St. Helena, where his corpse was found to be in a relatively preserved state, a feature which would be in line with arsenic inhalation from the wallpaper at Longwood House. The body was repatriated to France, and a state funeral was held in December 1840. He was laid to rest in the chapel of Saint Jerome, but this too was a short-lived stay, as in 1861, Bonaparte's remains were once again exhumed and reinterred, this time in the Hôtel de Les Invalides, where they have remained ever since. The Bonaparte family have had mixed fortunes ever since. As we have seen, his elder brother Joseph headed for the United States where he lived a lavish life by selling off some of Europe's most priceless crown jewels. Another brother, Louis, ended up in exile in Austria, peculiarly enough. His youngest brother, Jerome, managed to hang on to the title of Prince of Montfort after the wars, but like his siblings, he exercised little political power of any kind. Napoleon's own legitimate son and namesake was raised in his mother's country in Austria, though he died at 21 years of age in 1832 from tuberculosis, as that disease was beginning to become one of the most lethal killers across Europe. Napoleon's illegitimate son, through his long affair with the Countess Walewska of Poland, Alexander Kolona Walewska, became an eminent European statesman who contributed to the peace negotiations surrounding the Crimean War in the 1850s. But it was ultimately Napoleon's nephew, Napoleon, the son of Louis Bonaparte, who was his uncle's major political successor. In 1848, during the widespread revolutions which shook Europe's major cities that year, 
Napoleon came to power as President of France. Like his uncle, he later had himself proclaimed as Napoleon III, Emperor of the French, in 1852, and would hold that position as ruler of the French Second Empire down to 1870, when the outbreak of the Franco-Prussian War forced him from power. The Bonapartist line remains alive today, and for those who aspire for a return of the Bonaparte family to power, and there are some small few who view such a development as plausible, Prince Jean-Christophe Napoleon is theoretically Napoleon VIII. Napoleon Bonaparte was one of history's great figures. Whether he is judged kindly or poorly, nobody can deny the imprint which he left on Europe and the world in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. What is remarkable about this is that it was all so unexpected. In the summer of 1789, a revolution broke out across France, which would shake the established order of Europe. For years, there was violence, political toing and froing, and eventually dozens of people vying for power at the heart of affairs in Paris. But it was not Danton, Robespierre, or any of the other hundreds of officials who had either met in Versailles in 1789 or starved the assemblies of Paris in the early 1790s who claimed absolute power. It was the son of a provincial official of Italian heritage from the island of Corsica, a minor artillery officer at the time of the revolution, who would eventually ascend to become first consul and then emperor of the French. He did so on the back not only of his brilliance as a general, but also his exceptional political skill, his common touch, and his boundless energy. Even in his own time, many hated Napoleon Bonaparte, particularly so in England, but few could fail to admire him and his ascent. And it was not simply that he rose to power. In a great many ways, he used his authority for positive progress. When in Egypt in the late 1790s, Napoleon oversaw a scientific expedition which virtually invented the discipline of Egyptology. He also set that country on a course of modernization, which made it one of the most advanced in Africa and the Middle East. At home, he began a process of industrialization and infrastructure development, which had lasting impacts on the French state and economy. The Louvre came to occupy its position as one of the world's preeminent museums under his tenure. Admittedly, many of its treasures were looted from across Europe, and the plans for the museum had been initiated during the revolution, but Bonaparte furthered them, and in this respect, he continued to reveal himself as an enlightened monarch. Finally, there were a whole host of civil and social reforms. He reined back some of the excesses of the revolution and allowed Frenchmen and women to resume some of the norms of life prior to 1789. But in the promulgation of the civil code, he did more to advance the ideals of the Enlightenment than virtually any other ruler of his age. In many parts of Europe, it was only when the old order was reimposed from 1815 onwards that many people realized exactly what they had gained under Bonaparte and were now set to lose again. But there is also no denying that Bonaparte unleashed a dreadful wave of violence across Europe in pursuit of his ambitions. Indeed, his wars foreshadowed the conflicts of the 20th century. The Alm campaign of 1805 was the model for the German Schlieffen Plan prior to the outbreak of the First World War. French violation of neutral Prussian territory during the War of the Third Coalition foreshadowed the German invasion of neutral Belgium in order to gain an advantage at the start of the First World War. The humiliating peace terms imposed on Prussia by France at the Treaty of Tilsit in 1807, with the huge war indemnities, stripping of territory and requirement for Prussia to limit the size of its army henceforth, were identical in many ways to the punishing terms imposed on Germany by Britain and France through the Treaty of Versailles in 1919. The manner in which Britain sought to strategically control the North Sea 
by attacking Denmark-Norway during the gunboat war was mimicked in 1939 when the British government considered occupying Norway before the Germans could take control of its ports. Finally, the French invasion of Russia in 1812 was the first example of how a state which had already conquered most of Europe could see its power and conquests crumble in the cold Russian winter. Adolf Hitler had seemingly never heard of Napoleon Bonaparte's cataclysmic mistake and decided to repeat it in 1941 when he launched a German invasion of the Soviet Union. Throughout all of this, the scale of the wars increased exponentially. At Marengo in 1800, one of the decisive conflicts of the War of the Second Coalition, there were under 60,000 men on the field of battle. At Leipzig in 1813, over half a million men clashed, leading to the death of 130,000 individuals over four days in the hopes that Napoleon could retain his throne. This was the largest battle ever seen in Europe up to that time, and the Corsican bears the blame for this exponential increase in the levels of violence being seen across Europe in the early 19th century. The invasion of Russia in 1812 could be seen as Napoleon's fatal error, but things had been deteriorating for him for several years by that time. It is not hard to identify what his mistakes were. He became overly arrogant in his perception of himself as master of Europe, humiliating great states and rulers, and refusing to countenance the need for allies. Then he relied on incompetent family members and friends to try to rule entire countries. All of this backfired spectacularly on the Iberian Peninsula, with the Spanish ulcer bleeding the French of much needed resources from 1808 onwards. Furthermore, his obsession with enforcing the impractical continental system damaged his relations with his one remaining major ally, Tsar Alexander of Russia, and ultimately contributed to his fateful invasion of the Russian Empire. What all of this reveals is a man who rose from obscure beginnings to a position of immense power, based largely on his own abilities and, it is not unreasonable to say, his own greatness. But things started to go wrong not long after his decision to become Emperor of the French, despite the victories on the battlefield of the mid-1800s. Ultimately, the point of demarcation might be said to be when his foreign minister and close ally, Charles Maurice de Talleyrand, resigned in 1807. Talleyrand had come to believe by then that Napoleon was sending France towards destruction with his vaulting ambition and seeming desire to conquer all before him. He was right, and it was Bonaparte's undoing. What do you think of Napoleon Bonaparte and his fall from power? Do you think he would have been able to retain control of much of Europe had it not been for his fateful decision to invade Russia? Or were his problems mounting anyway with the Peninsular War and other conflicts? Please let us know in the comment section, and in the meantime, thank you very much for watching.